could you just give people a little summary of who is Team Believe Kenny Gibson? Ah, so first of all, Kenny Gibson is one of these children who in 1969 had their photograph taken at primary school. Now, we'll wait a few, we'll wait half an hour and if no one guesses, we're not coming off this this uh, celebration until you all guess who, who it is. <laughs> but I'm one of these children. So I, young lad, brought up in Scotland, uh, north of, north of uh, Aberdeen, tiny village famous for local hero, Pennon. Look at it in a map or Google it. And brought up there, went to secondary school, and I became a laundry assistant because I left school with no levels. I, I wasn't interested in, in education at the time and uh, went to work in a mental health unit as a laundry assistant. And lo and behold, someone called Cherry Morrison inspired me to be therapeutic and reablement as a, a and so I became a, a healthcare assistant, student nurse, and the rest is on my Facebook page, or as they say, is history. So currently wow. I'm the National Head of Safeguarding for the NHS, and I, I'm very much team believe with my husband. So we've, we've had a relationship uh, for about 35 years. We we got celebrate we got um, civil partnership in the Jubilee Olympic year 2012. So you know Queens had their celebrations and Queens had their civil partnerships. So we've been in a, a sort of committed relationship. And s about two years ago now, Phil developed advanced spinal cancer with uh, through advanced prostate cancer as well with a T6 paraplegia. And from that point forward. Kenny, the nurse, became Team Believe as our family because I had to bring a sense of positivity and affirmation and reablement. So my 42 years as a nurse, particularly in community and reablement, my 32 years of living with Phil came to that moment of rather than living the trauma of being the husband of a paraplegic, we both decided to seize the moment of advanced cancer and become Team Believe. And, you know, that's where we are at the moment, two years later, uh, Team Believe. And w w I think a perfect, perfect time to hand over to Danny, who is our wonderful host S with the most S for this series of Fab Talks. Danny, we've had a, a, a small chat. Everybody knows that this is being recorded. We've said it's a kind of conversation, talking in a memorial to the Queen, Queen's honour. So I will leave you and Kenny, I'm going to turn off my camera to have your conversation. And I'll see you all a bit later because I'm sure I'm going to have a million and one questions. Thank you, Kenny. Thank you. Thanks, Terry. And huge apologies. I'm not normally late for these things. Um, so huge apologies for that. Um, but welcome. Um, it, just listening to you already, you know, just the passion and, and, and it just oozes out of you and just following your social medias for as long as I have and seeing all the things, the early rises and things like that that you do. Um, you know, I've, I'm in absolute awe to be in the room with you today. So thank you very much for joining us. Um, it's really, really good to see you. Um, so I heard you talking there a little bit about who you are and a bit about Team Believe and, um, you know, things, you know, haven't been easy recently I can I can only imagine um but having that positivity and just having to keep yourself going um sounds like an amazing foot forward and he's um you know he's privileged to have you by his side so you know yeah. um there you go but so where did your journey begin then when where 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 was that boy inside of you that said I'm going to be a nurse there was a moment in in my tiny village when in primary school, my auntie was a, a, a ward sister in a and &E, and I just went to visit her and I thought, oh, what you do is interesting. But the real moment of saying I would like to do that was when I fell off a swing and broke my own wrist. I was 14 years old and I was lying in the a &E department thinking, you know, they're, they're doing a marvellous job. But the problem is I was about to leave school at 15 with no O-levels. So I, I just let that aspiration slip. 
But that 14 year old that it was an a &E overnight, that's when I realised nursing could be for me. But I gave up in the, the dream at that time because I left school with no levels. And the, the real moment of inspiration was when Cherry Morrison, the nursing officer in mental health, uh, took two or three inmates, they were called them, but patients from an inpatient mental health unit down to the laundry for a bit of occupational therapy. And I had the most marvellous time listening to them. I learned so much about humanity from those people. And Cherry Morrison saw something about my ability to listen and bear witness. And that's when my passion really took a hold. And I went to evening class to get two or three O levels. I, I studied as well to get two hires in, in a year. And it really gave me passion to mojo at that point when I realised that as a laundry assistant, I could go back and study to get the, the, the qualifications to go to nothing college. And where did that journey begin then? Where was your first kind of, you've, you're nearly qualified, yeah. um, where oh, did that take you? Well, in being newly qualified, it took me to a hospital that was reablement of dementia. I, um, I was two months a staff nurse when I was asked if I would want to be a charge nurse and go on a development programme. And uh, again, it was Cherry Morrison who said, apply for it, you know, and I applied for it. And it was a dementia reablement unit. It was one of those units. We had 30 patients, half of them were respite. And it was at the time of nursing development units with Steve Wright. The nursing process was being brought in. So 1985, 1984, 1985, I qualified. And um, that gave me the desire to be practical in the application of nursing research, compassion and reablement. Now, I, I didn't stay long in the ward. Uh, in fact, that year, 18 months, is the only time I've actually worked in a ward in a hospital with a uniform on. Every other part since 1986, I've worked in the community, I've worked in people's homes, I've worked across population and never with a uniform. So I'm not really a hospital nurse, but I've had the privilege, humbling, of working in so many other clinical venues, primary care, domiciliary care. So from 1986 was that moment when I learned to love research and love how to take the essence of what the recommendations from research and the evaluation and make it real for my colleagues that hadn't got the time to spend doing research was 1986 and Cherry Morrison again. Sounds like it was your real inspiration there then. She was, she yeah. was a fabulous imagine. inspiration. Great. So where are we now then? So what you, it sounds like you've had an amazing career. It sounds like you had the passion right from the very beginning to be able to make a difference within nursing and nursing care with research and with your, you know, with your passion to lead with that. So where does that lead you now? Where, where's, where's yeah. kind of the safeguarding element come into that? I don't know, Danny. <laughs> I really don't know. Five years ago, I was a director of public health commissioning for London, £586 million worth of public push and managing vaccinations for London and newborn screening and adult cancer screening for London with a few colleagues. And I decided I needed to get my nursing mojo back. And I, I saw a nursing job working with Hilary Garrett and and said, oh, I, I quite fancy being a nurse again, a, a pure nurse at that level. I applied for it. I was shortlisted. I went to have a conversation. The conversation lasted about an hour. I came out of the meeting and an hour later, I got a call to say, oh, we'd like to offer you the National Head of Safeguarding. So it's all a bit of a blur, that one, actually, Danny, what got me there. I think part of what I've learned about it is that as a national lead, 
it's incumbent that you need to have the skills, yes, of being a subject matter expert in a few things, perhaps, in order to have that gravitas, but critical to a national role. They need someone that can listen, can listen quickly, and can be a witness to what colleagues and practitioners are saying and be able to distill down listen after listen after listen after listen, dis distill down to key messages that can impact the chief nursing officer, that can impact the politicians, that can impact system leadership. And I do, I, I know I have an impact. People tell me things. I've got one of these faces that people just migrate to with trouble <laughs> and worry. And it's been really important as an advocate, it's been really important as a mental health nurse. I've had that clinically with my patients and uh, the carers and the families. So I think what they saw was a listener. I think what they saw was someone who was authentic in bearing witness to what I was hearing. And I think what they saw was someone who is not scared of talking truth to power. Absolutely. That sounds amazing. Did it bring your mojo back? It did. It, I, I've, had, I've had several mojo bringing back moments, not least of all being a fab ambassador, actually. It really does boost your, wow, we can do this together. The other one was, I let my, I let my NMC registration slip, as you do as a system leader. But uh, after five years, I did my return to practice. Oh, my goodness. Ten days of sheer bliss, learning the fundamentals of nursing again. So I did my return to practice at Kingston University with a social enterprise, clinical practice with a social enterprise. It was That was an amazing mojo. And this type of role brings that mojo back as well. Yeah. Absolutely. So do you, do you still do some clinical shifts to kind of keep I, your hands in? I, I, I do more than clinical shifts. I'm my husband's full time carer. Yeah. So um, I I specialise in reablement. So I support him redesign the house, etc. And self catheterise himself. Those, those types of things that a husband might do. But because I'm a nurse, I, I give him his Zolodex. I have total care planning with the district nursing. So uh, I'm I'm his clinician. 24 hours sometimes it seems, but as his carer, I'm still nursing him. And I do that with the GP and the district nurses. And uh, I do clinical shifts. I work as a volunteer in a care home. I volunteer during COVID, but I, I also volunteer in community aspects. So um, over the last few decades, I've been a volunteer with uh, youth clubs, with young people. I've been uh, vaccinating a super jabber in the Brixton soup kitchen. So wherever people need some sort of nursing expertise, not in hospital, I tend to go there, work as a volunteer, inspire them to be what they need to be, and uh, then leave them independent, perhaps with some practice nursing, or perhaps with some community nursing, or perhaps with some carers doing those important caring skills. So a, a lot of clinical shift, but it's very informal and it's more on a reablement nursing level. And that just sounds even more interesting than I think being able to dedicate your time, but also like, where do you find the time? It seems like you're a very, very busy man. Um, where do we find the time as nurses? We're, we're very good at fitting in, aren't we? Whether nurses go into a ward and see an extra patient that might need a part of an assessment, we fit it in. We are extraordinary time managers because we're nurses for shifts and then we go home and we care for our families. So I see part of the this sort of time management leadership of that nursing 42 years of the nurse has taught me is to look to other nurses to see how they fit things in. And we make it happen. Um, and so some days I'm exhausted and other days, you know, I get stimulated and adrenaline by fitting so much in. But you also have to have a balance to fit in self-care. So, Absolutely. for instance, at least 
um, an hour before I go to bed, I'll do some Zen embroidery or just some mindfulness just to get my myself back into the space of being Kenny. Then Kenny's Phil's husband and full time carer. And the last thing I think about is being the national head of safeguarding for that hour. Yes. Absolutely. And I think you're right. You know, um, I'm a nurse myself um, and I can probably, you know, list on probably more than two hands what kind of roles yes. and hats you wear in, in what any one given day, let alone, you know, in a week. Um, so, yeah, and I think we do. And I think we're very good at kind of understanding the needs of what's around us and fitting kind of fitting in where we fit to be able to improve that and make a difference to whatever it is that we're there and and I think when you're a nurse you never switch off there's always something that comes up like I've just picked my daughter up for example from school yeah. and um she's she's got a really barking cough all of a sudden and automatically thinking it could be this let's do that let's do this and even as a mum you kind of take that hat off and put nurse on and what can I do and yes. and I think that's what you do in life isn't it you just kind of think right what role do I need now what hat do I need and where can we be with that yeah. so, it's an interesting conundrum we never switch off and I think that starts when you're training and when you're a young novice nurse is people don't let you switch off the number of times as a student nurse that I was asked in Aberdeen oh my auntie's uncle's cousin's first brother is in hospital in ward 42 do you know him and you just think people have such regard for us knowing everyone who's in their hospital at this moment that we tend to know a bit of everything and so therefore that that's brought back to the frontal lobe of our memory we tap into that residual memory and i found this with phil you know 40 years ago i was told something about reablement and physiotherapist and it sprang to my the forefront of my my memory when phil handed in had a, an infected toe with bursitis and other things have fallen into memory from my 42 years that maybe an occupational therapist showed me to do something or, you know, a domiciliary care worker maybe advised me to try something different um, with a sort of drainage of an indwelling catheter. So, and these things constantly come back to the frontal consciousness when we're faced with a unique challenge of a, an occasion or a condition or a situation. Nurses have a very good memory retention and we're excellent at bringing to the forefront of our thoughts and options. Yes. Absolutely. And I think it's just seeing things and it sometimes and just think, and even if it takes you a couple of seconds you think I know that I've seen that where have yes. I heard that and eventually it does and you think I know where and you you know and I, I could probably think of all the things that I did as a first year student but I probably can't remember what I had for my dinner last week on Tuesday <laughs> that's um, probably because you had to see one Ed, see one do three and record five it's that recording <laughs> of five you think, I've done that before I've worked yeah. with Zolodex before it was my one. Of course I can do a Zolodex injection. I just needed to remember. <laughs> Absolutely. And sometimes it is just that that remembrance. It's like I know that we'll do that. And then it's a couple of times I've seen something and then it's like, yes, I've got that and I know that. And yes. um, you know, I bet Phil has um a, you know, sheer kind of empowerment for his own care because of the, the knowledge that you've got and what you can surround him and yes. giving him you, that empowerment to do what he wants. You, you would think so, wouldn't you? I couldn't possibly <laughs> comment sometimes having a husband who's not a nurse, but I do wish he'd stop calling me medical. You know, yeah. Kenny has loads of medical background. I'm a nurse, not a medic. So yeah. yes, sometimes he 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 has a he has a wider appreciation of what nursing has taught me. Yeah. He still doesn't know what I do, but then no one should know what I do and being the National Head of Safeguarding, the things that we cover and listen to and deal with, uh, that stays at work. But yes, he has a far wider appreciation of how the breadth of skills and the breadth of knowledge that nurses acquire, albeit over 42 years, but the breadth of it and the retention of it and the recall of it, he's amazed. Absolutely, yeah. I can imagine. And with that, with him saying, you know, the appreciation, there's obviously further appreciations because you're a Queen's nurse as well. Yes, there, Luke. Yeah. <laughs> so what, what brought you to become a Queen's nurse? 
Hey, what brought me to become a queen? So I was at that stage in my career that I wanted that sort of accredited recognition. I've never worked in hospitals. As I say, I, I was a year as a charge nurse, never worked in hospitals. And the QNI, the Queen's Nursing Institute, is that organisation that celebrates excellence in community, public health and primary care practice. And so um, it did take me three attempts. Yeah, it's about I know, yeah, I know, Joe's looking shocked that it took me three <laughs> attempts and six referees to uh, get it. So, uh, you know, and I, I'm a very reflective person by nature. I, I wear my heart on my sleeve and uh, completing the application. Some people think it's, it's onerous having a five page application, but you are celebrating your excellence in practice. But don't worry, folks. When you complete it, it's a bit like these sorts of sessions. When you reflect on paper, recycle it and re-gift it to your revalidation portfolio. Waste nothing. That's the Aberdonian in me. If you do something once, re-gift it, reuse it, recycle it many times in our portfolios. So I do encourage and please. If anyone is looking for a Q&I application, I'm more than happy to support them through it. Fabulous. And Jo's just said then she's a little bit of hope because she felt quite sad when she was rejected. Um, and you're not the first person there because I've, I've in my a few of my friends have also been the same. So um, and a couple of colleagues. So, yeah, and I, I think but I think it's so prestigious and I think it's so well deserved and uh, that, you know, they've got to have a, a due process, haven't they, to yes. be able to, to show you that. Also, Although I did have to explain to Phil that it does not mean me caring for the Queen. I'm not the Queen's nurse. It's a Queen's Nurse Award. So I had to explain that. <laughs> well, it was well, very well deserved. And that leads us well, nicely on to, to your next one. You were in the Queen's Honours this year as well, weren't you? I know. I know. Uh, and uh, so um, MBE. I'm I'm holding out for my gender neutral damehood. I have to say, Danny. You know, um, you know, I'll I'll be carrying on collecting the credits and uh, <laughs> probably aiming for that sort of equality yeah. thing if, if they're still going to have them. So yes, uh, I I got the the news in October, I think it was, and it it was strange news because in in my reflective practitionership every year since about 19, the mid 1990s, I have chosen to nominate two people. I've always done it. Every year I nominate two people for the, the New Year's Honours list. Very few people of them get shortlisted, sadly, uh, because, you know, there's a there's a, a formula to it. So, but I do have some shortlisted and uh, a few, a few out of those uh, have been awarded them as well. So it's quite nice being a nominee of a few successful applications. That's lovely. And that moment must have been, I bet you were so proud and I bet Phil was really proud to just see kind of everything that you've done over those years because, you know, it's an accumulation of really hard work. It's not something that, you know, you've not fought for, is it? And I think it's, you know, it shows that determination, that passion over those years. So yeah. huge congratulations. Oh, thank you. It you still feels a bit, of, I mean, as I said, in nineteen in nineteen eighty, I was a laundry assistant, and it does it does feed the imposter syndrome. It's what, how, what, what, what on earth has happened that in twenty twenty two, I'm getting an MBE for services to health healthcare and nursing. Where do I? What's why have I landed here? But that's the same as the post. So, and I think it's it's being brought up in a, a tiny village, and still no one's guessed who I am. So we're still here. We're folks. For those that arrive late, no one's leaving until you guess which one of these children is me. So, um, yeah. Oh yes, Joe. You know, there's no such thing as a free webinar. Um. So yes. It's I, I think many of us as nurses still have this imposter syndrome. We're very grateful for the Q&I. Absolutely. It boosts us. It builds our morale. It, it's inspiring to receive an, an accredited award like the Q&I. Um, it's imposter syndrome relating receiving an MBE. 
or an OBE. I can I can only imagine what I'll feel like when I get my gender neutral damehood. Honestly. Oh, brilliant. So when we talk about your role and yeah. we talk about the, the kind of leadership, so if you were to come across a newly qualified nurse tomorrow and they say, you know, I like I I don't know if I want to be a leader because there's so many different types of leaders within the NHS and we we instantly think that we're not leaders. We we instantly think that we're just nurses. We we automatically think that we don't have that in you know that incredible possibleness to make things happen. Yeah. What would you say to them? The first thing is the 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 system the profession must ban the word just or only a nurse we've got to stop it and we've got to have the compassion to stop it in every conversation whether it's a medic saying it whether it's a consultant saying it whether it's a board saying it so only and just let's ban them when it comes to any professional or any carer you know uh, the second thing is you are leading you're leading during your studentship you're leading during your novice ship in the first few weeks you are leading because there is no greater moment of leadership it is it is absolutely one thing to have 600 million pounds and the whole of london to buy vaccinations for that's that's a that's simple you try leading a patient with a lack of concordance a patient or a family with a lack of understanding towards a care plan that is trying to improve their health and their well-being and their their long-term condition that is leadership on a personal level at a patient interface level so you you know we need to reframe we need to unfreeze the the nursing process and really get to the heart that an individualized care plan with a patient is leadership of a person to do things they might not know about or they, they might not feel inspired to do, etc. Particularly around some of the interventions that they will need to have if they need to be safely discharged from hospital or live safely in their home. That is leadership of people. And if you can lead people, a mother persuading a child to go to school, then you you can lead populations. You can lead the 1.7 million people in the NHS. So I think we we must reflect on the impact of leading individuals before we begin getting concerned about the leadership of populations. And I think that's you've just hit the nail on the head there. I think that's it, isn't it? I think when we we come out, everybody, ju- um, you know, and I can I can think about it. Just um, I so I don't work um, as a nurse full time. I work for the local maternity system. Um, I'm a, and what I do shifts because, um, like you, I lost my mojo and I needed a little bit of time to kind of get that mojo back. And now I do shifts within my local hospital to kind of see where I want to be, what it is I want to do. And there's a dishearteningness of people saying, oh, well, I'm a band six now, I'm a band seven now, who I qualified with. But for me, I've never thought of leadership as, I, I probably don't want those roles. I'm quite happy to remain the band five. Um, or if I, you know, maybe go sideways and become a, you know, a clinician, a, like a practitioner, um, yeah. because I'm very much like to lead the patient rather than yes. the staff themselves and I love working with newly qualified and uh, students and learning so much from them because actually like you said they lead the way as well they're brand new into it the knowledge that they come out with yes. the university updates us you know or as much as we'd like to think we keep up to date there's always new nuggets of information that they might say that you then go home and have a look after and you know keeps you going doesn't it keeps you on your toes as well and and I think that's it. It's about leadership from a personal level as much as it is from, you know, a system level. Yes. And I, I think that leadership must be the willingness to listen to the people that you are leading. As you can see, 1969, I was I was a, a seven year old and it is really important. I don't represent the voice of children in 2022. And what I've learned in my leadership 
at the national head of safeguarding is despite the social movement on social media, I have the tiniest voice in the whole of safeguarding. I must. This cannot be Kenny's trauma. This cannot be Kenny's lived experience. And it goes back to this idea of what I've learned as a system leader is to listen very quickly to the host and full range of every voice, particularly the unheard and the unseen and the unknown, and quickly distill it either into a hashtag or more importantly into a key message that I drip feed into other people, system leaderships, more strategic people to say, eventually you'll get what we're talking about. You'll get that it's leaders need to listen and then they must bear witness to what they've heard. Otherwise, the listen is a waste of time and people won't relate to you. And it's that bearing witness to it that is fundamental to the so what of listening. But you've got to have the foundation to prepare to hear and listen and then to encapsulate it into a bearing witness to. But nothing that Kenny Gibson says as a national head of safeguarding or indeed Early Risers Club or any positive is any of his own language. I've just learned to re-gift people stuff that works for them at that moment in their lives and they take from it what they need. That's all I do. Recycle, re-gift, reaffirm that it's going to be okay. And that absolutely encompasses what the Fab Academy is all about. Yes. Yeah, it absolutely encompasses what our ambassadors are about, what our what our academy is about, and and how we, you know, we don't reinvent the wheel. We're there to support systems, and we are there to open up um, our kind of. And again, it comes back to those failings and those learning from those failings. It's about being happy that you've you've tried something, it didn't quite work out. What's next? Rather than you know, drud, kind of judging back through all well, we just didn't do it, and you know, overthinking it. Actually, somebody else down the road may have tried that. How else can we do it slightly differently? Yes. And you build and work from that, and that you know, you've just and what and and as nurses, we stand on the shoulder of giants when we come to that. There are people on this call that I've learned from the social movement. They have encapsulated the lived experience from their areas and their specialisms and their lived experience, and they have gone native on social media to inspire social movement um, in all sorts of hashtags. You know, it has been a phenomenal success, uh, social media, social movement. It affirms, which is an important aspect of leadership, but more importantly, it brings hope that any one of us or every one of us is suffering a bad day. It may be life, it may be home, it may be work, it may be just shit life. However, if we can keep hopeful with each other, then again, that's such an important part of our visceral sense of what nursing is. You know, to mutually support each other at those rough, tough times uh, and bring hope. And you certainly do that. You oh, certainly do you. that. And social, just like I said, I've been watching social media for a very long time, so you absolutely do that. And I think... But if if you notice, none of my posts were designed by me. No, not a single post. I'm sorry to disappoint all my stalker <laughs> followers on social media, but I, I do not create any single post. The only one I've created is listen, believe and do something. That's the only one I've created. Everything else I have been in awe and inspired by it and therefore I have chosen a moment simply to repost it, re-gift it, recycle it and again I think it's what nurses do well. We, we read the moment and our empathy is simply incredible. Our compassion is second to none but it's our empathy of what to say or not how to say it or silence. It 
that's what nursing, well, particularly my mental health nursing, that's really the essence of what I've had to learn to do. Absolutely, and I suppose in mental health nursing as well, you've you've got that where people are losing hope um, very much in, in, yes. certain, in certain illnesses, and I think trying to find that hope for them is, is what keeps them going. And I, and I know from listening to a lot of uh, people that I come across through the mental health charity, I think it, it's just finding, like you say, those little nuggets, and it really yes. does kind of help to, you know, to bring about hope um, mm-hmm. in, in really dark times. Um, <laughs> And I think it's living proof as well when you're standing there going through adversity yourself of whatever it is in your background, in your home life, because, you know, we all go through something. It's kind of hope that's hope in itself, isn't it? That actually we can, if they can do it and stand in front of us, actually I can do it stood next to you. Yes. I mean, we do all go through things, Danny. Um, I think nurses, midwives, carers, we go through more than some because of our nature. Um, and because of people's flawed conception that we're able to cope with additional layers of bullshit and additional layers of trauma, you know, and uh, additional layers of lack of support. I think nurses just take it on board and take it on board. And I think this is where COVID has shone a light that whether it's a speak up guardians for us or whether it's a listening lounges or whether it's just us reaching out to each other and say, I'm here. I'm a listening ear. I mean, there's an exemplar uh, at the moment in social media where one of us as a nurse posted about someone missing and there was a an outpouring of digital digital hugs for that person and that would have been so important for that friend for that colleague to just appreciate the virtual space and we had this in covid where we couldn't meet but we still had to be able to show each other compassion empathy respect and virtual hugs and that was missing for a few decades uh, in nursing but certainly you know it's been brought back to life now when we have a chief nurse who is able to sit in her car with her face dented with her covid mask having worked a shift in the front line and show emotion that was visceral that trauma that our cno witnessed and and yet we've got some provider chief nurses and system chief nurses that thought it was appropriate to go around and drop boxes of chocolates at the door of ITUs and not even have time to have a cup of tea with colleagues. So, and again, you know, nurses needed presence and listen, they didn't need presence and chocolate. And I think some chief nurses and system leaders will look back on their reaction to staff, you know, through the window, here's a box of chocolates, here's your Easter egg, as a mistake. That what they should have done is have, you know, just a comfortable place to go and have a cup of tea and a listen. Or bring a pet in, you know, bring bring something bring bring yourself and your humanity to your work don't bring your hierarchy and your vsm wage or your your title you're still a colleague and you're still a person so and uh, i think by reflecting on the covid inquiry we will see a lot of this issue is was i humane enough was I humble enough to be a person or did I go into hieratical mode? I think most of them went into hieratical mode. Absolutely. Um, and just with the, the last um, 10 minutes or so of um, the conversation, I think yeah. that has been absolutely amazing. So thank you so much. I've thoroughly enjoyed listening to you and I could listen to you for another hour, um, but I won't take you away from your precious time that I know that you um, you, you're going to appreciate the time after. Um, but has anybody got anything in the audience that they want to just bring in and ask him or um, even just a comment or, or anything for our lovely Kenny? No one wanting to know which one I am. 
curtail the pain of being here? Penny, just yeah. reassure you, you, you haven't got long hair and you're not wearing the sock, uh, the white socks, are you? So that, so that kind of. It might be a kilt. Ah, <laughs> you see. It now there we go. Now, Kenny, could you give us a clue with it, 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 what colour was your hair, Kenny? Oh, my, my hair was jet black. Okay. I'm very Calvinist. Dark eyes. I know, Joe. My hair was jet black until I began working with you. I right. So just to curtail the moment, there's someone in in here. There's there there's there's someone with a side. There I am. Side parting, dark hair underneath the second window. There I am. There. But the uh -huh. reason I the reason I use this is to reinforce, and I always do this a week before exam results time, is I had a fabulous, incredible, incredible childhood. I knew I was loved, never cuddled because we were Calvinists, but I knew I was loved. And any one of these children could have become a nurse. In fact, probably about 12 of them did, all female, but uh, there's a high percentage of my peers in the, the village and the, the town went to nursing college. But there's something about children and their development that at, even at that age, I was nurtured to be of a community. That's why there are very few pe photographs of Kenny on his own, because Kenny is about we, not me, and Kenny is about us, not I. And I think it's a very strong message that this gave me, and nursing has embedded into me, Danny, is, you know, Kenny has a few badges, the glint, but more importantly, I am so proud to be part of nursing because it's protected me, inspired me, in, in all of some of you on here, so yeah. That's why I use this photograph. It reminds me of we and us, not me and I. Penny, can I say something? I'll, so obviously I, my background is a colorectal and stomach care nurse. Um, and our paths have crossed through fab, but also through my, my clinical work. And you have helped my clinical colleagues within stomach care so much with the insights around um, being curious, listening, yeah. having conversations, not being afraid to ask, to ask uh, appropriate questions and following up on the answers that that you get. So you've impacted significantly on me as a clinical hospital-based stomach care nurse and my colleagues hugely and through fab um you know through through fab you just you have a thing you say i think it's on one of your bios you bring your own sunshine yes oh and some to every so you know there have been times through the last seven years with fab where it's been really challenging balancing a my day job and fat and my colleagues and you have always been there supported whatever crackpot ideas we may have come up with at the time you have we had there. a few well we have had a few yes I, I remember that lovely time in the uh foyer of yes. Skipton House the oh. atrium absolutely so oh, for atrium, those that weren't atrium. there third third far birthday party 30 cupcakes and about 300 helium balloons it felt like anyway uh, we decided to sing happy birthday and uh, someone from a higher balcony from the chief exec's office opened the window and said would you be quiet so we sung it again louder <laughs> no we will not be quiet because <laughs> i i think what fab does as well as early risers as well as team believe as, as well as things like this, I think as nurses, as people, we deal with shit life all the time, whether it's conditions or in, a, in our case, in 
Joanne's case as a safeguarding specialist, the most awful moments. And we, we get it. There are hideous things happen. There are hideous things happen. However, in the hopefulness and the looking forwardness that we are so good at, we must learn from excellence. And I think that's why I feel an affinity with celebrating excellence all the time. Yes, I'll bear witness to incidents. I will. I will look at every dead baby and see whether we can learn something. I will look at every vulnerable adult and see if we can lose, uh, learn something. However, to this day, to my core, I know that 99.9% .9 of nurses and clinicians deliver good to excellent care. And we've got to shine a light on that. We've got to rebalance the conversation when politicians come after us time and time and time and time again and diminish our light and our sunshine by focusing on the one or two incidents. We are yeah. excellence personified and we, sh we need to celebrate that. Absolutely, and I think that again, that's that's the academy. That's exactly what our ambassadors are doing. That's exactly what we're doing. That's what exactly we see you do, isn't it? Yeah. You know, it's showing, it's showcasing, and you know, with the MBA and with the Queen Nursing Institute, and you know, we're not very good at shouting about ourselves. We're not very yeah. good at shining light on ourselves and our own care. And if something happens, we're always the first to go. I'm really sorry about that. Even if you knew you had no bearing on that at all, you're the first to say I'm really sorry. You know, we always apologise for for everything that happens, even before us. And I think, you know, just like you said, the resharing and the re the re you know, the the, the recycling and, and things like that that you do with everything, yeah. it's it's so, just showing that actually with every negative, there's always ten of positive. Oh, we just never ever talk about it or yeah. see it. So someone someone's put a very sage what I think it was Betty. Hello, Betty, see you tomorrow morning. Um five AM. Um it's nothing else than Early Risers Club, by the way. I don't want any gossip circulated that I don't. Exactly, Joanne. So, yes, um, I think we 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 do have to re-celebrate that, don't we? So it's, it's about changing that lens. Yeah. Make your own sunshine. Yes. Become fab well, ambassadors, everyone. Yeah. But also in my day job, one of the things I did with Professor Alison Leary was develop a website called the Apollo Nursing Resource. Yes. Free for everybody, standalone website. And it actually, although originally for specialist nurses, actually is used by allied health professionals, yeah. ward sisters, ward nurses. And it's just tools to help you demonstrate the value of what you do. And yes. one whole section, if you go on it, is about language and vocabulary right. and the passive language that is inherent in our in our profession, which arose from nursing, uh, you know, uh, uh, holy orders, nuns. So yeah. we, uh, we, we developed from this very passive um, kind of dutiful handmaiden kind of role and we've we've kept hold of that and so there's a whole yeah. section mm -hmm. so which you know Kenny absolutely personifies and I I want to to say why don't we start a new hashtag Kenny keeping it real Bless I think you. there should be. Yeah. I'm my own hashtag for the first time in 42 years. Who'd have thought? Keeping it? it real. Keep because Kenny we have to. We have real. to keep it real. Yeah. <laughs> so that's my take-home message. So sorry, I've totally lowered the tone. But you know, I'm a colorectal nurse. What can you expect? So, but you know, um, Danny, thank you so much. This has been an awesome. Uh, uh, fab talk and thank you so much for inviting Kenny and um, uh, yeah we'll make sure this gets up on YouTube uh, with any bloopers potentially removed um, oh or, yeah. no let's be rebels. keeping it real let's have Do the it. bloopers in 
<laughs> one final thing to say then before we go just after listening to everything you've said and I always like to end on a little quote and I think it just with you bring you know bring your own sunshine it was it was very much along that line so great minds think alike because one of the quotes that just looking through your kind of social media your um your career and just listening to you tonight we cannot direct the wind but we can adjust the sail yes absolutely yes marvellous <laughs> Now, just remember, if anyone needs support with our Fab Ambassador application, Terry and Danny are your people, don't bother me. <laughs> Q&I applications, more than happy to support you with that. And, and all things that, recycle them in your portfolio. Marvellous. Thank you for the opportunity. Thank you Thank so you. much. I'm going to wait to be a husband. <laughs>